mm -hmm. that's, that's where he's going. So I've been kind of stuck wanting to do more stuff. And this has gotten me up. Pokemon has gotten you up and moving around. Yeah, who fucking knew? Yeah, it's been doing that for me as well. But anyway, I'm Johnny Jungle Guts, the <laughs> top notch gamer, aka the top notch gamer. Oh, what's that? You can go over here. And this is another episode of Let's Gay. Today on the show, I have Evan Conaway. Evan, Hi. do you want to tell everyone a little bit about what you do and what you're working on right now? Um, so I'm a PhD student at UC Irvine, and I am in anthropology, and I am studying queer gamers and online games. Great. But more broadly, I'm just looking at just queer gamers in general and also like technology and how gay gamers access them to do cool things. Sure. And so for a change uh, of pace today, uh, Evan, while we're playing Final Fantasy VI, is going <laughs> to interview me. That's the idea. Sometimes I feel like every episode of this show is an interview with me because I just love to talk. I'm always <laughs> constantly trying to figure out ways to rein, rein in on that, but what are you going to do? Um, but now Evan's going to ask me questions about being gay and in <laughs> games. Yeah, I only know a little bit about you because of our mutual friend, but also because you have a Wikipedia page. I do have a Wikipedia page. <laughs> How'd you get that Wikipedia page? Um, I don't know. I know they do a lot of group Wikipedia, uh, artist groups do, um, events where people edit on Wikipedia, and, um... And, like, usually they're editing, uh... Wikipedia pages for queer people, people of color, women, artists. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was part of that? I don't know. I haven't really looked into it. I would just kind of enjoy it because I don't have a website. So Yeah, that basically is your website, right? It basically is my website. I, I'm, I don't have the audacity to link people <laughs> to my Wikipedia <laughs> page. I've, not, I've yet to do that, but I'm pretty sure... It's good if someone was like, oh, who's that? And they will see that, and then they will know who I am, more just or less. Just time to Google it. Google me. <laughs> yeah, just Click Google the me. keys and Google me. <laughs> oh, so, wait, someone's dead here. Uh oh, uh, that's all right, though. Um, oh, can't yeah. run away. That's never good. And you don't have any who's magic. Dead? Lock. Oh. He's like a thief. He's great. But the dog's going to come in right now. All right, what am I doing here? Oh, do I have a really powerful spell? Yes, let's see what this does. Boom. Well, that was good. <laughs> Try disaster. Let's see if this takes him out. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, but, uh, yes, it was, a, it was a great honor. It was very, I felt very edified by the Wikipedia page. I'm not going to lie. Which is so funny because anyone can have one, really. All yeah. you need, as I understand it, is all you need is um, like a couple pieces of press that are not like written by you, <laughs> right? Uh, a couple pieces of, of media. So one of those was about your Pokemon exhibition, and I wonder if you could talk more about that. Yes, I absolutely could. Um, uh, do you mean the drawings? Yeah. So yeah, so my last uh, big solo show was at a gallery called Human Resources that I really love. It's right down the street, and it was an exhibition of um, all the poke drawings of all the Pokemon uh, in Sumi Ink. Very simple, black line drawings mm -hmm. on uh, large, larger pieces of newsprint. It was. Uh, it's a pretty big gallery. I think the ceilings are probably. Uh, almost 25 feet high, maybe not that high. Um, and it was pretty much floor to ceiling. The whole big room was just Pokemon. It almost had a uh, op, uh, op art effect or something. It was visually, uh, there was a lot to look at, I think. But people really loved to look at it, people of all ages. And uh, it came out of a very spontaneous urge just to draw all the Pokemon and uh, feel more sort of uh, fulfill my obsessive need for intimacy with that media it was really was really it I think but uh, it was a lot of fun and I stand by it as just a general 
general work of art because it was kind of just about how insanely large the sort of bestiary of Pokemon has become. There's so many Pokemon now, 800 Pokemon, and it's like it's whole, it's this whole cartoon universe. Like, it's just insane. And also, you know, that event and most of the Pokemon events that I do, pretty much all the Pokemon events that I do are also function as get-togethers for people who play Pokemon. We'll have tournaments and uh, and what we did. I did a panel discussion at the Hammer Museum nice. about Pokemon. Um, what did you guys talk about there? Well, that we did it right when Pokemon X and Y had just come out. Okay. And so uh, we talked about the new game. Uh, it was me. Well, I was the moderator, or no? What? My I was not the moderator. I was on the panel. And then a guy named Alex Fasciani, who does um, a video series with his girlfriend about uh, about diff different Pokemon, explaining their origins and stuff, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we had a female Ash cosplayer and a nine-year-old boy. And that was the panel at the ham Hammer. Awesome. It was uh, pretty cool. I don't think a nine-year-old boy has ever uh, done a panel talk at the Hammer Museum before. How was that? Oh, it was great, and it was the first uh, event I did, and there was such a huge turnout. Uh, people had come, taken like three buses and slept overnight at their brother's house just to come to this thing, and it was the most uh, anyone, a total stranger, just wanted to do something that I was doing so badly. It meant so much to them, and so it was it made me want to do more, uh, more with it. And, uh, and so I did. And that, that, and more eventually translated into that show where I had all the drawings up. Yeah. Cool. So, what other kind of artwork do you make besides Pokemon drawings? Um, well, I do this show. I was, um, on an episode of Storage Wars where I praised the collection of My Little Ponies. Nice. That wasn't quite artwork but it was very diplomatic i think for that community that's why i did it i hope it was and um i uh do like a lot of performances and wonder woman costumes i did a, a video installation that i sang along with that featured like um it was a lot about just different like i sing i sing uh like an 8-bit version of uh malibu by hole over footage of like princess peach is really? a big part of it and then um and then i like sing do you ever play kingdom hearts do you know that game yeah uh well i really love the song the song from that game that my sanctuary and there's a really beautiful piano cover of it on youtube and so i sang over that and I interspersed it with a lot of footage from when I used to play um, City of Heroes, which was an MMO, superhero-based MMO, right. that I really, really loved. And um, and uh, so yeah, and that was and it was sort of my my sanctuary in a way. So uh, so that's like the type of stuff I do. I used to make a lot of artwork about animals, and I used to do a lot of. I mean, I still volunteer at the cat shelter, but I used to do a lot of projects in wildlife conservation and uh, and wildlife rehabilitation. And I think a lot of that was inspired by like a sense of adventure in nature that Pokemon and other RPGs like it sort of espouse. Uh, really, not anything to do with. I mean, when you look at really the. The logic of Pokemon, it's horrible. Like, the, the story and everything like that is so stupid. Oh, absolutely. But the, um, that, that spirit of, um, of adventure, because Satoshi Tajiri, who created Pokemon, when he was a kid, he was a big cave diver and a spelunker. And he, um, he loved to collect bugs, too. Probably not a surprise. Hmm. But the, his favorite places... Okay, his favorite places to go, uh, hiking and spelunking or whatever, all got, you know, developed into housing or whatever, man-made structures. And uh, so he wanted to create a game for Japanese children that mimicked that sense of adventure in uh, 
quote unquote nature that uh, that uh, he had as a kid, and so it's kind of Pokemon's origins are kind of sad in this way. Um, uh, 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 but but I think he did kind of capture lightning in a bottle in a way, and uh, uh, and it's funny to see how it's sort of coming full circle now with Pokemon Go that is a game that actually does encourage people to go outside and move around uh, and you know nature is a kind of a weird term it sort of sometimes feels like a binary I mean ultimately it just means things that are not man-made but it sort of seems to take on other definitions and be a little bit divisive between you know what we've created as humans, which exists, is natural in a way, um, and what is uh, not, because you know, if humans humans are man made, man made, you make humans by having sex, and so then are we like inherently unnatural, right? <laughs> or are we or are we not man made? We evolved from something else, so we're not even man made. Uh, and maybe by extension the things we make are not man-made. I mean, this is all just kind of weird stoner logic, but this is the things that I think about when I think about people going out and having to navigate the world uh, by playing Pokemon Go, which has had a lot of great results of people getting exercise and tweeting about how their legs are sore. I've seen a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've seen... We're in a very uh, not good time, I think, in our country. Or maybe it's a really good time because people are starting to realize some of the things that have been going on. And Pokemon Go is a game that's developed in Japan, a country that is 99% like Japanese people, I think 90% actually. All the people who live there are Japanese. Uh, so there's no um, real substantial racial disparity. And then... <laughs> On top of that, as I understand it, uh, sexual assault uh, is like really, really reduced in Japan, or the rates are a lot lower than here in the States. So, so these are things that don't get taken into consideration when you design this sort of game. Not that you that those things should stop you from designing this sort of game, I, I think. Um, but uh, but I've seen some uh, you know gamers of color posting and tweeting about how they've been having conversations with people that they normally never would because they're just walking around playing Pokemon Go. And I think that that, it's not for me to say that Pokemon Go is bringing people together, but if that's their opinion, I, I think that's really great. So, so that's my spiel. That's a, that's <laughs> a chunk of my spiel on, uh, on some of that stuff. Yeah. Cool. That was a question for later, so you answered it already. Oh! Um, so, broadly, you consider yourself an artist. I do. So what motivates you to do art? Um, to make art? That's a funny question. I started making art in high school. I took an art class mostly because I, um, I wanted to be a writer for comic books, American comic books, and in American comic books there's usually a writer and an artist, and I wanted to have, this is, you know, like 10th grade logic, mm -hmm. I thought if I knew a little bit about art, then I would have an easier talk time talking to an artist about comic books, but I really took to uh, doing, I, I was really, well, good's kind of the wrong term, I was really fascinating to people as an artist because I was actually really, really bad at drawing in this like ex sort of a really extreme way. Like, like if I, like, you know, like just something as simple as drawing a nose in the middle of someone's face, I would like miss, like, I would just like, I was just like so bad and I would get <laughs> so stressed out over every line and it produced these sort of like kind of minimal little kid cartoon drawings that looked really sort of stilted and oversimplified and uh people loved them really and uh so i and that was and i was so i really excelled in art at school 
in this weird way, um, because I was really bad at, I was a horrible draftsman. I mean, I'm a, I'm a lot, I'm, I'm, prof I'm actually not bad now, but it's taken me years to get to just like a place that I've seen people like basically be at the first time they ever drew anything. Um, but, uh, but it was this weird challenge and, and I liked, um, I liked the, uh, I was, I was good at it, so I thought, well, this is what I should go to college for, this is what I'm, this is what I'm, I'm good at in school, so I'll just, uh, I'll do this, and, uh, it's kind of, a, and so then I ended up at art school, and it was around that time that I started getting really into wildlife conservation, and so then a lot of the work became about that, and so then I was making work for animals, or for healing relationships between people and animals, and um, that was really heavy and got really intense. And so for fun one time, I had, um, it was my senior year at CalArts. I'd done a study abroad uh, on an animal sanctuary in Bolivia where three monkeys had died. And, and it was really intense. And I was making work about that. And I wanted to continue to make work about that. But I also... Um, I also wanted to maybe take a do something light and fun, and so I organized a Pokemon uh, uh, tournament, and it was sort of very in the style of like the Warriors or something like that. It was like loud, throbbing, happy hardcore music. Like punk bands played over the battles. The trainers would go in like these cages during it. I like rapped at the beginning. Um, a lot of people showed up before before the show started we basically just were posting drawings of Pokemon all over the school and like stickers I bought like a Pokemon sticker book and just covered like the whole campus with Pokemon stickers and then people would like collect the stickers and like put them on things and then I made a uh, what's his name Chuck Close do you know that artist Chuck Close he makes oh. like it's like very, very fine por portraits that use like, within the portraits are like images of other portraits. Okay. I guess this is a bad, bad analogy, but basically the thing that we projected the battles on was just like a wall that was just completely covered in stickers, uh, Pokemon stickers. So it was like Pokemon on Pokemon in this crazy way. I see. Um, anyway... It was really fun, and uh, and people really responded to it. And then I took a, I, but I didn't continue with that. And then, um, but so I don't know. I, I make I make artwork for animals. I made a lot of artwork for wildlife. I did a I did a twenty four hour Pokemon marathon. Uh, that was a fundraiser for wildlife, and um, or, or no for a cat shelter pretty recently. But I don't know, I've made different art for different reasons, I guess is the best way I could say say it. But I, it's got kind of just uh, fallen into it a little bit, but I, I, really, I, really enjoy, I really like it. How do you think your sexuality comes into your artwork? That's an interesting question because I was noticing on my, Wik I'm, was noticing on my Wikipedia page that there's no mention uh, therein of me being gay at all. And it, and it, uh, at least in this particular, some of this particular work, it didn't really come up. It comes up a lot more in my writing. Okay. I'm currently working on a book that, uh, is going to be put out by closing in, in the near future. Cool. Um, collected writings. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I talk about sex and sexuality a lot in that. I mean, I think it's affected... I think it's affected my work. It's funny. I've noticed a lot of gay gay people come to my stuff, my Pokemon stuff, and I I don't know how they know that it's like an inherently gay friendly vibe. I hope that everything I do has is feels gay friendly, but um, but I, I definitely have a little crew now of uh, gay guys who are really into games that I'm friends with. That's really special to me and uh uh and it comes across it comes across in um 
it comes across in some of my video installation work, you know. Uh, I did this uh, performance once where it was like a slowed down, chopped and screwed, really heavily edited, um, like chopped up song from My Little Pony. Mm -hmm. And I sang over that. I have a, like a really deep singing voice. Uh, and so I think there was something kind of queer about that of a, of a uh, grown man singing, um, singing songs about ponies or singing this sort of abstract there's no lyrics to it because it was so chopped up but it's sort of the video is, is all this really you know pink and yellow visuals and butterflies and everything right so it was pretty gay <laughs> um it's hard sometimes it's, i get it's getting harder and harder to delineate between art and life when i used to play uh, city of heroes i was in a gay all gay superhero league that was cool I remember, because my character was, I think his name was Johnny Monroe or something like that. I can't really remember what he was named, but he was like essentially a, uh, like a twink, a twink version of Storm from X-Men. Yeah. And, um, and he was, looked great. Like he had these, this sort of like, um... Gianni Versace, Miss s &M era bondage top with like a lightning bolt on it and like, you know, knee high boots and like booty shorts and then like a big gold chain and this like sort of swooped white hair. I think like literally the palette swap for his hair was literally called like hipster or something, but, <laughs> but uh, I got hit on a lot in City of Heroes as Johnny Monroe and, um, and it was cool being in that league. There was a guy I remember named Nightcock, and he was like a like a, a rooster that did karate. He was pretty <laughs> cool, and he would like he would kind of like Leroy Jenkins it when he would come in the room. He'd be like, "Here comes Nightcock," and then he would God. like like come in. It was pretty funny. That's amazing. Yeah, it was great. I loved that. Uh, yeah, so it's it's definitely affected my work, and also like affected the games that I want to talk about or I want to play. You know. Okay, Just, what do you mean? Um, well, I think video games are... I used to think that nerd fandoms and, and comic book fandoms and video games and all that type of stuff were just really politically and socially diverse in a way that the art world wasn't because the art world's so liberal. But lately... Um, like, the art world's so liberal that, like, nothing you do really seems that that challenging ultimately you know what i mean mm -hmm. um where as in games i find that there's still a lot of i mean like gamergate was such a fiasco and sort of really i found it really disturbing and uh uh like just stuff like that and so the games i want to play like i don't really want to play like, The Witcher 2 is probably cool. I don't really know that much about it, but, like, I'm kind of more interested in a game like, I don't know, like, Undertale, that's, like, kind of about, like, this, like, amb gender-ambiguous brown person that doesn't really need to fight anyone. Like, that's, that's kind of cool to me. Or, uh... What other games have I never played that I'm looking forward to playing soon? Portal? Never played that. Really? I mean, I'm looking for, yeah, because I, sometimes I feel like I, I, uh, I haven't stayed contemporary enough with games. In some ways, obviously, I have, but in other ways, I feel like I've totally, like, not been paying attention. And that's kind of why I wanted to do this show, just to take time, have the time in the week to play games. Though, obviously, this game is, like, more than 20 years old, but, um, I never beat it as a kid. And I've made so much art about Final Fantasy VI. In high school, I made, like, an eight-foot-long painting that was uh, all my friends as characters from Final Fantasy VI. And then, like, the things that would happen to the characters in the game was, like, kind of happening in real life. Just, like, weird stuff like that. Like, someone would, like, become a couple in real life, and then they'd become a couple in the game. Or, like, someone's family would die in the game, and then their parents would get a divorce in real life. Like, just, just weird stuff like that. So it was a very like, almost spiritual experience doing that painting, and I have, like, a very, very intense relationship to this game. Um, though right now I'm really struggling to figure out where Narsh is. 
Uh, could you pull up on your phone yeah. World of Ruin map uh, Final Fantasy VI on Google? World of Ruin. Okay, playing with the map. What are you looking for? Uh, Narsh. The, the town is called Narsh. Narsh, that's number 18. Let's see. Okay, it's up north. Okay, going it's north. that dock right there. Okay. All right. Let's it see. looks like it. Let's get into it. There we go. It's confusing because it's like a... It's like a... Uh, cave instead of a building. All right, let's see where we are in the strategy guide. <laughs> Could you read me this little chunk right here? Under Narsh? Yeah. With lock at the head of your party, make Doing tracks it. for the weapon shop. Okay. Don't know which shop that is, but we're going to look around. Uh, um, so, yeah. Or, um, and I'm not even, like, one of those people who's, like, really, like, anti-violence in games, you know? Like, I enjoy, I enjoy it sometimes. I, <laughs> I think I like cartoon violence more than, like, really graphic yeah. stuff. Also, you know, like, I think there's, I think, um, um, like, I'm really interested in, like, uh, like, Anita Sarkeesian's Steam Curator list. Like, I kind of want to play all those games. Um, and, you know, it's like, it's like food for thought, you know? It's kind of interesting how, like, so many female game characters have this, like, funny sort of, like, catwalk model walk when they're, like, going through a game, you know? Yeah. I think it's okay for there to be a little glamour in, in games and stuff like that. I enjoy it, but I don't think every character, every female character, should be acting like she's, you know, Beyonce when she's actually, like, out here trying to, like, raid some tombs or be a jewel thief. I think, actually, Lara Croft, they've really toned, they've really toned her down, made her a lot more realistic recently, but... Like, Catwoman. I mean, Catwoman, I think, is fine because it's Catwoman. Like, that's part of the character, but, like when so many characters, female characters in games sort of are, you know, this one very specific kind of sexual creature, entity, uh, you know, you, you have to start uh, diversifying, I think. You should be diversifying and, and doing, doing different kinds of female characters and minority characters. And How do you feel about queer representation in games? Um, I mean, it's pretty bad. It's pretty low. Uh, there are definitely exceptions, but, um, like, I know Zarya in Overwatch is, is everyone loves, because she's, like, a big dyke, and, uh, and that's really cool. I was seeing, like, you know those anime, um, mouse pads with the boobs? Yes. I saw someone post this, like, sketch or drawing for one of those anime mouse pads but instead of the boobs it was Zarya's shoulder and bicep that's amazing and I was like oh that would be so cool if they actually made that um but no I feel like oh here we go we're gonna get in oh yeah Locke is able to unlock the door it's pretty easy check then, the back room and speak to the man he offers you either the stone Ragnarok or the sword Oh, what is it? What should we pick? Swords come and go, but the best espers in the game do not. You'd be a fool not to choose the stone and get the magicite Ragnarok. Okay, yeah, we've got to do that then. Uh, I feel in this stone. If I were to grind it down in the shape of a blade, leave it as the magicite Ragnarok. All right. I always get so nervous in those moments that I'm just going to click the wrong thing, you know, for no, like for literally no reason. They both looked exactly the same. It said the magicite Ragnarok. On both of them. Yeah, it was like, do yeah. this or don't do this. Yeah. It was confusing. I think what I did as a child, instead of, instead of, because there was never, when there's not, um, when you, when there aren't any gay characters in a video game, what you do is you sort of, um, insert them in, like, mentally. And I see, like, a lot of weird sexual politics in video games that are probably not, like, really that relevant like in Zelda I always think about how Zelda is kind of about how you're just constantly putting this really effeminate boy in like a never-ending sequence of dangerous situations like 
that kind of relates to the queer experience, I think. I've been thinking about it, though. I think they kind of did Ganondorf dirty in Zelda. I mean... Why is that? I mean, like, he's... Well, first of all, he's pretty much, a, like, more or less of Middle Eastern descent. Because he's hanging out with all those, like, women, thief women in the desert or whatever. That all, like, dress like they're in a harem. And then, so that that's, like, one thing uh, that's a little problematic about him being the villain. Then the second thing is just that he's... Zelda, you, when you're playing Zelda, you're preserving, you're preserving the monarchy, in a way. Like, what's the, uh, what's the appeal in that? It's sort of like in, it's sort of like in Die Hard, where, like, the whole point is to, like, you know, save this corporation. Like, who cares? It's just a corporation. But, uh, and then I've had, like, a, I had a lot of crushes on video game characters as a kid, like, uh, who are some big ones? Well, Solid Snake. Solid Snake, uh, not only is his name a euphemism for a hard dick, uh, his voice was so great. David Hayter. David Hayter also wrote, like, the first two X-Men movies, so I'm just kind of generally jealous of him. Uh, those movies were not as good as they could have been, but that's a pretty diverse life to write two X-Men movies and be Solid Snake. That's pretty cool. Oh, go back into town, by the way. Oh, go back into town. Yeah, don't leave. You have to go find a man in bed. Where do you go? So, go into the house above the relic shop. Okay, I think I can find that. Which I think was over there to the left. Yeah, I think you're right, it was. There's the gun, there's the sword shop. I sort of really big crush on Barrett from Final Fantasy VII. Do you know that character? No. Barrett is the... You can Google him. Google him. He's like, a, he's definitely very bearish looking. Uh... He's got a gun for an arm. He runs the the Final Fantasy VII. You're basically part of an eco terrorism group, and uh, he's kind of like the leader. He's a very loving father. He says a lot of wise things, uh, and he's pretty beefy. And he's a black guy, and that is how I would describe Barrett to to audiences. But uh, I was really into him. And then also, uh... Yeah, here's some fan art. Ooh, yeah, that's pretty good. Those original Tetsuya Nomura drawings, though, that were in the manual. Ooh, he was so handsome in those. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Um... Or, uh... Well, like, Mario, you know, is like, uh... I find Mario to be kind of weirdly, you know, sexy and acrobatic and... Bowser, too. I've got, you know, I get, it gets kind of weird sometimes in my in my uh, mental headspace. Dry Bowser. Oh, you like Dry Bowser? I have a little crush on Dry Bowser. All the bones. I like the. I just like the idea of Bowser kidnapping me. That sounds fun to me. <laughs> it's fucked up, but it's my it's my fantasy. And I just love Mario. I think Mario is okay. Wait, what are we doing in the Elder's house? Oh, it says. Leave the weapon shop, go into the house above the relic shop. The man in bed there will give you the cursed shield. Okay, let's see that. I think we're in the right spot. My friends and I, we play Mario Kart. Sure. Uh, the newer one. Yep. And each character has a kind of personality. It's taken on a personality of their own. And Dry Bowser is like this 18th century gentleman from England. Oh, yeah. And he always is out and about like, oh, my bones. <laughs> and Pink Old Peach is a monster. She, Pink Gold Peach is a little scary. She has a very, like, high-pitched, like, screechy voice. There's no bed here, so I'm saying this is not it. Yeah. Mario only talks in, uh, pasta names. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I just think Mario is, like, kind of on that, like, Alice in Wonderland level, where it's, like, really iconic, but, like, really, like, weird, like, not, not, like, necessarily... Like, the story's kind of fucked up in a way, because it's about, like, kidnapping and stuff, but it's just, like, so inventive and bizarre, and you just sort of accept it and take it in because of because it's a game, and the, the linearity of that makes you want to go from point A to point B, so you just sort of accept that there's, like, all this, like, weird monsters and drug use and just, like, crazy stuff going on. I love it. But, uh, I don't know, what do you think about queer representation in games? 
oh, I think it's pretty abysmal, but I think that a lot is being done right now in queer game studies to sort of remedy that and also do a lot of queer readings of games. Yeah. I think it's probably the most valuable thing. Yeah. Because I don't think it's going to change unless hiring practices change in the game industry at this point. And so, yeah, I don't know. I think the queer readings is probably my favorite thing. Just, like, completely placing a queer relationship or a queer identity on top of a character, I think, is, like, the most active thing we can do. Oh, yeah, that's all you can do right now. As a player. Um, wait, what do we do after... Did I... What do we do after we get the... Uh, if you fight 255 battles with this equipped, it becomes the Paladin Shield, the best shield in the game. Oh, okay. That's, that's all there is to do. Do I have it? Do I have the Cursed Shield? Let's sort. There it is. There it is. We got it. So, I will equip that to Antone. gonna suck for a little while. How many battles do you have to do? 255. That's a lot. It is a lot. But I'm gonna, maybe that's what we'll be doing the next couple episodes. We'll just be just be powering through getting those battles in. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, look how horrible. He's like so dead. <laughs> He's just like, has every status ailment on him you could possibly have. Confusion. He just killed himself. Uh, oh, poor guy. I wonder if he has to live to maybe if I just equip like horrible weapons on him he won't be able to kill himself uh and um you know games offer people so much opportunities to play with identity and I'm I still really fully embrace that like I remember playing Final Fantasy 11 during the Bush years and it was so great because nobody really knew I was an American like like it, I was just free. I was just free from that, in that, in that, uh, in that moment, and that was like great because I was not happy to be an American at that uh, at that time. So, um, but uh, you know, it's the same in comic books. Like, there's so few. Um, like, such bad representation, uh, it's not, I, I'm actually a little bit past the representation side of it, um, I actually don't think representation is that bad in American comic books, uh, uh, there's a lot of characters out now, like, um, Midnighter had his own comic book series, that's a, like, sort of like, sort of like gay Batman, I mean, that's simplifying it, but... Uh, but what I want to see is more, like, gay writers in, in, uh, in doing the, doing more creators. Because right now it's pretty much just, there's just one guy named Phil Jimenez who writes, like, Wonder Woman and stuff like that. And he's great. I, I, he's one of my faves. But, uh, it'd be cool to have some other, other stuff going on. I mean, Alan Moore, I don't really know what his sexual, probably identifies as, like, a serpent or something, but... <laughs> Uh, uh, it's it's uh it's still pretty slim out there, and also you know just for everything, I don't think I don't think there's ever been a black woman who wrote a Marvel comic book. I don't think that's ever happened. Really? Yeah, because I, maybe it's different now. It could be different now, but I just remember in 2013 there was an episode of The View where Whoopi <laughs> wanted to write a comic book, and they and she was saying that if she did, she would be the first black woman to write a comic book at Marvel and I haven't heard of black a black female writer um, since then the other amazing thing about comics though is there's a lot of people whose work I know I know what their artwork looks like I know how they write but I have no idea what they even look like or I could be wrong about I think I've been wrong about people's gender before really just based off the name like Remember the guy, there was a guy who wrote Batgirl named Kelly Puckett, and I assumed he was a girl, because he was writing Batgirl, his name was Kelly, but he was a guy. And then there was another time it happened where it was the opposite, it was a, it was a female artist, but I thought for years that she was, uh, she was a guy, or, you know. But Wasn't writing Batgirl as a guy? Right now, yeah. Oh. But also then. 
The guy, a person drawing Batgirl right now is a girl. That's oh, okay. Tar. Oh, that's who. Okay, I, got, um, I saw her at a comic, like, a Long Beach Comic Con or something. Yeah, she's great. Um, she's really cool. Uh, and then uh, there's Gail Simone who writes for DC Comics. It's a great. Uh, Barry Tate has written some stuff I really love, and uh, G Willow Wilson is another uh, female writer that I really love. Um, if you want to go back into the Stone Ages, Ramona Fraden was like the only female DC creator uh, in like the, you know, f I think 50s, 60s, and she, I love her drawings, I think they're so great. Um, and uh, Sana Aminat, who does all the character development at Marvel now, is a Pakistani lady, and who I think she's so, um, so vital. I love her to death. But anyway, what um what games have you been playing lately? Um, so we just moved, so I haven't had access to a lot of stuff. Oh, what am I supposed to do next? Oh, go to the far south island. All right, it's called Beach House. Oh yeah, I know what we're doing. I know what we're getting into. It's the house where you first appeared. Yeah, I was playing Destiny for a while just to like pass the time. And also one of my advisors was playing it, so we'd play sometimes together, which is pretty weird, because he's faculty at UCI, but we actually had a lot of fun. We played a couple of times together, and we didn't talk about school at all, which was really surprising, but I enjoyed it. I, I typically am not an FPS person at all, but I got drawn in. Something about it. Oh, what am I supposed to do here? Ooh. If you were able to catch a lot of yummy fishes, you might even find Sid alive and kicking him. No, he's dead. Well, that really makes no difference. Head down from the house to reach the beach and pick up the Palador Esper. That's cool. Let's get that And then you head back to Thamasa. Yeah, we're just doing a bunch of little stuff today. We're ripping through. In order to go to Thamasa, by the way, you need Strago and Realm in your active party. Good to know. Good to know. It's like the town, the magician town, as I understand it. Okay. What are we doing in there? Is it like a whole mission or oh, it's just a little uh, quick thing? Yeah, it's just a, it's a lot so of we, quick things. We don't need we don't need uh we don't need to be in fighting fighting form. I don't think so. Uh, and then were you one of the gays who always played as a female character as a child? Yes. That's such an amazing um thing, you know, because it wasn't like we could coordinate on that. We were just little no. gaybies, and we all did it. We, like, all did it. It's just wild to me. I think I didn't... I never always... Okay, I feel like I always did it in, like, multiplayer games, that there was a female option. Right, no, no. Like, I mean, like a lot of games, games you can't choose to play. You can't even... You don't even have the option. Right. Um, but, uh... Even in Pokemon, I think I was a boy, typically, because I wanted to represent myself. But in these, like, more, like, temporary roles, like... Like, Tekken and things, I all... Like, June was, like, my thing in Tekken 2. Mm -hmm. Always played as June and Michelle. I mean, I just feel like... Uh, uh, it's different when in Pokemon it's like what you just said it's like this weird blurring of a line between uh, like reality at, because you are encountering these Pokemon at, at random in a digital wilderness so they're not they're not uh, alive but they are sort of specific and real and those are those are your Pokemon that you found at a certain time in a certain place that that are unique in a lot of ways whereas with like a game like Street Fighter or a game like this even the story is like set and linear and doesn't connect to um it doesn't connect to other people in the real world or or the non-digital world and so you 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 do you get more into the the sort of spirit of the kind of like the role play of it I think is why we do that yeah, bit. but yeah, I always played as Chun Li. I always played as Zen Fa and Soul Calibur. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Molina, I loved Felicia on Dark Stalkers. Storm on um, Marvel vs. X Men vs. Street Fighter. It was always it was always that. That was always the that was always the the, the, the thing. And I don't know what my reasoning was Chun Li was like kind of just the best too on Street Fighter 2. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, she was definitely the easiest to play if you weren't like a uh you know, some genius of of uh of fighting games. 
So, oh, maybe, maybe this is one I can use. I love his little twirl he's doing. Oh yeah. All right, let's just just kill them all here. Or maybe I'll just give them good good spells. But we're just going in there and getting like an item or something, right? So it says, watch the scene when you arrive and then leave the Masa. Right above it is the opening leading into Evox Evitz Rock Cave. Oh, okay. Okay. Alright, we're doing scenes. I must be the only one getting old. Grandpa... And so, what is your thesis about? Um, oh, it's so up in the air right now. But right now, I am looking at the idea of a queer server in online games and how servers sort of come to embody queerness because a bunch of queer people go there and make it queer. Are there any? What are some? So, right now, I only know of two. In World of Warcraft, it's Proudmoore. Uh -huh. After the character Jaina Proudmoore, I think Noah, Noah sort of moved there over time because of the name, and then that is where like if you, people assume that everyone is queer there. Okay. And then in Guild Wars Two, it's Crystal Desert. Oh, that's good to know. I was thinking about playing Guild Wars Two. Is amazing. 2. Yeah. There's a trans character in there actually. That's pretty good. They're in um in yeah, I forget what the main. I haven't played it in so long. Lionsgate, I think it's called Lions Arch. Lions Arch. It's like the main hub, but. Yeah, Guild Wars 2 is great. Crystal, Crystal Desert is the query server, but in Guild Wars 2 it's different because you there's the mega server now, which is like connecting all the servers together, and it basically means that you have a home world, but guilds can exist across servers. Oh, okay. So that sort of breaks down. So I'm interested in, in like the way different people perceive community at the server level, because so much academic work has been done on guilds, and we know a lot about how guilds work and how people find guilds and join them and what the hierarchies that exist inside of them are. But okay. servers are sort of something that has been unexplored and they're also like a technology, like a physical material thing that is becoming more virtual now. And so I'm interested in how that change is going to affect social life in online games, especially for queer people right now. Sure. And women also. Yeah. Okay, so now... Oh, yeah. You go out the back, or you just leave the, you leave the town? Then leave the Masa. Right above it, is, you'll find a rock cave. A rock cave. And is that a long dungeon? How big is the... Uh, let's see. It looks like there's a boss. Oh yeah, there's the little entrance. I see it. I you to, see it. You want me to read this to you? Yeah, read me just a little taste of it. All right, when you get into the cave, step onto the button. Note that the buttons on the ground in this cave will warp you around randomly, making it impossible to give exact directions. Simply keep stepping on buttons and opening chests. Eventually, as you keep warping, you'll find yourself below an open chest with hopefully at least one piece of coral. The chest is quite hungry and wants a lot of coral, so if you don't have enough, you'll need to keep warping around and opening chests until you do. It gets rather annoying, but with the Moogle charm equipped, it isn't so bad. Oh, the Moogle charm. Okay, all right. Let's get into that. The Lulu's charm. And all if right. you get enough coral, you find a boss. All righty. Where is that new Esper that we just got? What is this? Oh, these are good spells. Um, maybe not. Maybe yes, actually. boss ones so um so yeah um i don't uh i don't really know where uh like it's just so funny to see games now getting more sort of uh accepted in ma mainstream culture like you know when i did the first pokemon tournament People were like, why are you doing this? You are a grown man. And I was like, you are correct. Uh, but, um, <laughs> it's fun for me. And now it's like, you know, the Getty Museum and LACMA and the new museum are all tweeting Pokemon Go pictures. 
you know, like, it's, it's the, the sort of comfortableness level is changing, and obviously a lot of games are made, uh, most, I think, you know, most games now kind of are, are made for adult audiences, um, and, uh, and that's, that's cool. Yeah, even my brother is playing Pokemon Go. He just texted me yesterday and said they downloaded it. Sure. Which is surprising. But we did. I mean, when we were younger, he got Pokemon Red and I got Pokemon Blue. I remember yeah. that very, very explicitly. Mm-hmm. But then he sort of, like, became not nerdy anymore. Yeah, and then was he, like, mean to you? He was mean to me for a little while. Just a little while. Um, but we're friends again. Malulu's Charm. Where is it? Malulu Charm. Can o- I wonder if only... Oh, apparently only Mog can equip it. Okay, let's get him in here then. Uh, I wonder if... Maybe I don't... Let me see if I don't need Strago in the party to... Apparently you have to. You have to. And Realm? It says, I had Strago and Realm in the party because I was forced to use them. Okay. I had Mog in the party because he can equip the Moogle Charm. Okay, so and then, then... He also said he had Sabin? Alright, that's probably the most logical thing to do. Even though I'm not really trying to train Sabin right now, but what are you gonna do? He's pretty, pretty bossed up. Um, it's also just I don't know. I just really enjoy going to cons way better than I enjoy going to art openings. Like, I just wish I went to more conventions and stuff like that. That well, I, I don't do. You. I don't know. It's hard. It's like. It's, like, hard to break that cycle of, like, being in the art world and feeling like, oh, I've got to go to this friend's performance, and I want to go to this friend's performance, and this is, like, you know, like, that type of thing, because they came to my thing, or, um, just stuff like that, I guess. But I I think I am starting to really branch out. Like, the 24-hour Pokemon-a-thon that I did, that was insane. It was completely nuts. It was, it was, like, one of the most intense things I've ever done in my body. Like, a race of playing Pokemon with other people where we, like, f- had tournaments throughout. So, it really, we, you know, we weren't just leisurely taking our time. It was, it was, it was war. Um, was it really 24 hours? Yeah, 24 hours. Wow. We, we played Pokemon for 24 hours straight. And, uh... You know, you get to a point around 5 a.m. where you're like, why am I, why, why am I doing this? Why did I think this was... And it was funny because when I heard they were porting Red and Blue version to DS, that was the first thing I thought of. I was like, we're going to do a 24-hour marathon. Like, that's what I want to do. And I've done stuff like that before. Like, I did a 24-hour performance piece where I set up, like, three TVs that were all running Final Fantasy VII and then played through it with, like, other people joining on the other TVs from time to time. But that was, like, there was no competitive element to that. So it was really, like, lovely and relaxing and fun. Um, whereas the Pokemonathon for the animal shelter was, like, (laughs) so grueling, and, but the thing about that was, like, yeah, it was, like, this weird thing, um, okay, we got, we, do we have coral? Okay, how do we get the coral? Where? You have to keep on pressing the button and going to chests. And okay, we obtained five pieces of coral. Up. Yes, feed the chest and coral. Okay, wasn't enough. Go get some more. Okay, so you gotta eat a whole bunch at once or it won't fill you up. Good to know. Uh... But like the thing about that was it wasn't it wasn't an art piece really at all or it wasn't it had no real relationship to art and that was really the first event that I did that was completely disconnected from art like the I did those I did a bunch of guerrilla style tournaments but they were like at the Getty and LACMA and it was kind of like I don't know if you've been to LACMA but they have all those um, lights it's this there's this installation that's just like a bunch of street lamps all like really heavily focused in one place is the best way I could describe it. Okay. And, um, and it, uh, it looks kind of like something you would see at maybe like an electric type gym. And then the Getty Museum has this like garden that was designed by a guy who was trying to communicate with aliens and it's really beautiful and it 
kind of looks like a grass type kind of vibe. So we were kind of trying to like utilize those spaces as like makeshift Pokemon gyms. Cool. And uh, and and that was like really cool. And the turnouts were like really nuts, and it was really fun. But it was definitely like this thing because a lot of people who would a lot of people who play Pokemon who would go to those um, would be like. I've never been to an art museum, or I never thought to go to an art museum, or I didn't think art museums were for me, or something like that, you know what I mean? And, uh, and that was kind of cool, because, um, uh, you know, just, just a new space for people, and another thing I realized doing a lot of Pokemon events in LA is that the art world is, you know, since it's sort of an academic world, um, it's pretty white. And the Pokemon trainer, the thing about games and comics, even if the represent, representation is bad mm -hmm. for whoever, even if all that all that's really exists is corporate interests, which I be, which I believe is true on the not on the creative end of it, but you know Nintendo as an entity, corporate entity, Marvel as a corporate entity. Um, the way in which games and um, comics are distributed is much much more egalitarian than art than in art because if you spend fifty dollars on a video game um it's not nearly as much as uh spending you know a thousand plus dollars on a painting or a hundred thousand dollars on a degree in in art I mean, I think there's more money in, in the art world than there is in comics publishing. Like, if you look at the number of art galleries in L.A. versus the number of um, comic book stores, it's, uh, it's a lot more. There's a lot more art galleries and selling things for way more money, you know? Right. So I like that. That's the thing about games and comics is there's, there's just that egalitarian mode of distribution that isn't, isn't in any way devoid of... Uh, an interest in capitalism, but uh, allows people from all different backgrounds to participate, and that was that was like the coolest thing I discovered from organizing Pokemon tournaments in LA. Uh, Do you plan on doing that again? Yeah, uh, I'm, I've been emailing people about doing a panel for the new upcoming game. I'm probably going to have another show of all the drawings in in uh, in sometime in the f June, maybe, I okay. think. Is so you still have all the drawings? I have a lot of them. I sold some of them, but I have a lot of them. Cool. Um, and I'm going to do more, because there's going to be more Pokemon. That's, like, why I would... That's the only reason I'm I really see. doing it again. It would be stupid to just do the exact same show, but it's... I mean, it'll look similar, but it will be different, too, in a way. Um, Who are your favorite Pokemon? Well, that's changed over the years. My first favorite Pokemon was Dugong. For those of you who don't know, that's like a, it's like a seal with vampire fangs and a unicorn horn, which is it's a lot cuter than what I just described. <laughs> um, but I love Dugong. I trained my Dugong to level 100 in fifth grade wow. without rare candy cheats. I was really proud of that. Then um, I really kind of took a break uh, in high school. And then um, first year of college, someone as a joke gave me Pokemon. Um, as a gift, birthday gift, I think it was, uh, oh my god, I can't even remember the name of the version, there's been so many, Pearl, Diamond, I think it was, Okay. and, uh, and I just, this was, like, so into it again, and, um, but I've had a lot of different favorites, Cubone is big, um, I really like Obama Snow. I would say my favorite types pretty consistently are Ground, uh, no ice. Uh, I don't really <laughs> like. Sometimes I get a little like annoyed at Pokemon that are like. I mean, I like but I like it. I like them. I, I do think it's funny, but I'm, it's not my favorite. Like Pokemon that are like ice cream cones, but I did like the one that was a trash bag. That was really great. Oh, Garbodor. Yeah, uh, I really enjoyed that. How many pieces of Carl do I need to feed the thing? Oh, I don't know. It just says enough. Just has enough. I wonder how much is enough. Um, Garbodor is great. Uh, 
I really love um, Shaman. Um, yeah. Which one is that? Shaman is a hedgehog with the power to turn pollution into like, like it can purify the air. It's a legendary Pokemon. Um, it, it's it's pretty cute and dainty. Uh, it has a sky form that's grass flying. Oh, I see. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, I love Nido Queen because her breasts are really subtle. <laughs> um, I think that's really funny. Uh, yeah, those are some of the big ones. Those were some big ones for me. But college, college was definitely, um, college was definitely Obama Snow, and now it's probably Kingdra. So I would say the lineage was like Dugong. Obama Snow, Marowak, Kingdra. Those have been my favorite Pokemon over the years, definitely. Okay. What about you? Ditto. Ditto's iconic. Yeah, I've always loved Ditto. I used to collect Ditto cards. I still have them in a binder. Ditto's the one you use when you're breeding Pokemon to sort of really intense effects. Or you just make your entire party. All six. <laughs> Ditto. Ditto's. You've yeah. done that? Yeah. Is it fun? <laughs> it was fun for a while. It gets kind of old. Yeah. Because you start out and you can't do anything. And then the other Pokemon just has shit moves and you're stuck. Right, and it's also like this thing of like, they always get that first turn before you use Transform, right? So yeah. it's like, you're always handicapped. Like, you're never not handicapped by Ditto. I don't know. But it's I can see where that would be fun, like a fun play mechanic to do. A fun way to play through the game. Yeah, and they're cute, and they're pink, and they can sort of... I don't know. I like the idea of things that can like morph into other things. Oh yeah, it's great. Waters, what's going on? Uh, what time did we get started? Oh, I don't know. We got started around probably five thirty or so. Five thirty. Well, then we should probably wrap it up. This has been another episode of Let's Gay. I'm Johnny Jungle Guts. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Evan, and interviewing me. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime. Uh. And uh, is there any uh, way we can keep posted about your research or find out more about it? Oh, yes. Okay. Wait, I have a website now, but I always forget what it is because it's a weird Google website. All right. Look it up for okay. us. So it is goo.gl. That's like the Google site thing. goo.gl backslash capital H number four, lowercase sw, capital E number seven. Okay. And that's my website. All right. Send that to me and I can post it in the links for sure. this episode uh everyone stay tuned uh, august 20th i'm gonna be throwing a party at precinct in downtown la called super smash brothers i'm really excited we're gonna have super smash brothers tournaments and chip tune uh nightcore all afternoon it's gonna be kind of like a beer bust and uh stay tuned for that sunday afternoon august the 20th